60 Minutes Rewind. If you said that the National Rifle Association, the NRA, has done more to prevent the passage of a federal law to license and control handguns than anyone else, you'd find almost no one would disagree with you, including the NRA itself. If that's true, how does the NRA do it? Where does its power come from? How does it throw the fear of defeat into the Congress of the United States? Well, tonight, we're going to take an inside look at the NRA, an organization whose voice is loud and clear, as Jimmy Carter will learn if he tries to fulfill his promise of a strong law to control handguns. But to some legislators, men like Adlai Stevenson, the issue is not gun control, it's the NRA itself. And that's the issue. The issue isn't any longer uh, control of pistols. The issue is the gun lobby. It's whether or not the government can stand up to the gun lobby. And so far, the, it hasn't been able to. And this is the NRA in full array. The NRA is over one million strong in members who are organized into almost 10,000 clubs across the country. And when they assemble an annual convention, they are bound by a sense of history. In no other country in the world have so many free men been permitted so many weapons in peacetime. The NRA was founded over a hundred years ago to improve the breed, to help make the citizen soldier a better marksman. And that connection with the U.S. military has continued down the years. Until recently, the Pentagon tie-in made it easy for NRA members to get ammunition and target practice at military installations at reduced cost, or even free. Although federal budget cuts have cut down the favors, the military connection between the NRA and the Pentagon remains close, warm, and fraternal. And so are the ties between the NRA and the manufacturers of small arms. For the NRA is not just hunters and sportsmen and conservationists, it's the marketplace of a billion dollar industry, or billions if anyone can ever count the value of all the small arms weapons, miniatures and antique guns, the ammunition loaders and sports clothes, the bits and pieces of hunting, fishing and shooting equipment. Critics complain that the small arms industry, in effect, subsidizes the NRA with heavy advertising outlays in the NRA publications. But NRA people scoff at this, and neutral outsiders, if there are any, point out that the arms people would advertise no matter what the cost, as a matter of pure self-interest. At any rate, the symbiotic relationship between the NRA and the small arms industry is like the tie that binds the NRA and the Pentagon. Thanks to you, the members and supporters of NRA, no national gun law has passed this year. It is not likely at this time that one will pass if we will stand together, strong, dedicated, shoulder to shoulder for what is right. This is Harlan Carter, vice president of the NRA and its former chief lobbyist in Washington. Pistol champ, unyielding, uncompromising, long a symbol of NRA resistance to anyone who would try to license, register, or outlaw handguns. Any national gun law, no matter how innocent in appearance, no matter how simple it might be, presupposes a still further growth in a centralized, computerized, gun control bureaucracy in Washington, D.C a monstrous invasion of the rights to privacy of you law-abiding and decent people who have never committed a crime and concerning whom there's no evidence you ever will. But tough as Harlan Carter and the NRA leadership may be against any gun control, many believe that the membership is even tougher. The members of the National Rifle Association and gun owners throughout the country are sick and tired of getting the blame for the criminal element that uses firearms. We are tired of seeing the criminals receive probation. We are tired of seeing the courts let the criminals go and watch the legislature concentrate on lawful people who own firearms, the honest citizen because he owns a gun to defend himself. That's what the NRA is about. 
And the most important thing that sticks in my mind is this organization stresses proper and safe gun handling. And the reason that I'm so familiar with it is because I'm involved in, the, in that program in Boy Scouts of America, and anything they endorse can't be wrong. A census taken a few years ago found that over half the NRA members were family men. 80% had gone through high school, 20% had a college degree. About a third were white-collar workers. Most earned around $15,000 a year or more. In short, just about middle, middle America, with plenty of clout in the professions. And a good number of them are local elected officials. The NRA is trying to recruit more young people and more women. Dues are only $10 a year, and many have taken out life memberships for $200. Only life members can vote at conventions, and at the last convention, they were able to vote out the former leadership, which was suspected of having gone soft on the gun control issue. Harlan Carter was voted back in command. The vote gave warning to gun control advocates in Congress that the hardliners were back in charge of the NRA. Take the guns away from the American citizen. This country will go communist just like Russia or any of your others. It's been a proven fact through history. If you take my rifles, my shotgun, and my pistols away from me, are you going to take the bullets and arrows too? <coughs> and then what are you going to do then after that? Take the pocket knives, the hunting knives? Or, you know, where's, where's the stopping point? And if he comes into my house and he's pointing that gun at me, I'm going to tell you one thing. I'm not going to meet him with the Holy Bible because I'm going to meet him with one of my own. Critics of the National Rifle Association might regard it as nothing more than a sinister group bent on preventing the Congress of the United States from passing gun control legislation. A cabal that holds the power of political life and death over the Congress. Or they may regard the NRA as a group of near Neanderthals, gun-toting rednecks who shoot first and ask questions later. But the fact is, most NRA members are what's generally described as average Americans. Average Americans with a particular passion. It may be hunting, or as with these people, marksmanship. And they're no more likely to go and stick up a bank or go berserk with a gun than you or me or any non-gun fancier. They regard their guns as the tools of their sport. No more dangerous, they feel, if used properly, than a tennis racket or a bowling ball. And if anyone typifies how the NRA's clout works, it's the longtime captain of the championship U.S. rifle team, a Californian named Jim Whitney. I gather your involvement with the NRA and with shooting has gotten you involved with, in politics. Well, yes, it has, because we find a city councilman or a state senator or a congressman that's uh, of our persuasion, we offer our help. Now, we have all of our clubs available and all of our individual members available. And these people, in regard to the gun issue, are pretty much a one-issue voter. And they will support this type of person. They'll not only support him with a vote, but they will support him with uh, uh, stamp uh, licking and envelope stuffing and all that sort of thing. And in our own place in Los Angeles, there's been two instances where Without the votes we cast, our man would not have been elected. This is not to say we elected him, but if the votes weren't there, he would be unemployed. But supposing you approach a congressman who doesn't agree with you, and supposing he's in a district that he's won just marginally, by a few hundred votes, a few thousand votes, what can you do? Well, we approach him with the facts, because these are readily available, and if you find a man that's got a marginal vote, you know the percentage he won by. But if we find that he's in there pretty skinny, like 1 or 2 percent, we just lay it on him and say, oh, look, we can muster, say, 40,000 votes in this area through our gun clubs. We've got the mailing list. It's computerized to the zip codes here. Now, how do you feel about this particular program? Do you want to keep working? It's and what does the politician usually say? They usually play ball. They usually play ball. And when they don't, they don't, they, they don't last long. They don't gain any seniority. Do you figure that, that nationally the NRA has that kind of club that can almost, almost pick and choose as far as congressman is concerned. No, concerned. I don't think that. I don't think that at all because uh, although we've got a million people, you have to get these people organized. And this is where the NRA organizes its million plus members. This is headquarters in Washington. Plush, computerized, heavily staffed, well-funded, and geared for action. 
Friend and foe agree the NRA's power to scare congressmen lies in its ability to mobilize its members in any congressional district at the touch of a computer button. To raise cane with any congressman who may be thinking of voting for gun control. There is no proof that the NRA has ever defeated any congressman on the gun control issue alone, and the NRA does not make that claim. But the threat against a congressman who may have been elected last time with less than 5% majority is enough to make him pull back from the gun control issue. The NRA also mobilizes enormous write-in campaigns against newspaper articles or television broadcasts that it feels do not support the right to bear arms, and against advertisers who sponsor such broadcasts. It may seem to some that the strident voices run the NRA. The fact is that they are supported by more sober, thoughtful men. Noisy or quiet, the NRA does speak with one voice. Gary Anderson is an American rifle champ, a minister and a member of the Nebraska State Legislature. I think, I think one of the things we have to, have to do is simply to recognize that solving crime is, uh, is going to involve solving a, a very deep-seated social problem and that uh, just picking up uh, on one single, one single issue, namely the gun, is, is really not going to, uh, going to solve the problem. I think uh, we're starting to come together on, uh, on the idea that, uh, that we need to punish those people who are using firearms in the commission of a felony and, and make this a much more serious offense. And we seem, we seem to have some agreement there. Now, maybe we can focus on things like that, and if we can get together on that kind of a thing, maybe we can see that we're really after the same thing. But if NRA members see the real issue as a breakdown in law and order, NRA critics say the issue is basically guns. Handguns. Not revolvers and pistols in the hands of law-abiding gun club members like these people in upstate New York, but weapons like these that end up murdering people. For many, the rising crime and murder rate is a direct result of too many guns too easy to get. The NRA argues that no one here will ever likely be involved in a crime, to which critics of the NRA say, if that's the case, what's the objection to licensing and registering handguns? Because, says the NRA, that would be the first step to confiscation. And they point to the biggest test case last year in Massachusetts, which had a referendum that, in effect, would have outlawed all handguns in private hands. A leading gun control advocate was a sheriff, named John Buckley of Middlesex County. Never once in the whole history of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts has any bill dealing with handguns ever passed the Massachusetts legislature without the approval of the National Rifle Association. And I rest this case in the fullest of confidence in the people of Massachusetts that they have seen enough violence they have seen enough murders, and they will outlaw the deadly handgun. But the NRA and its friends went into action. The Massachusetts referendum to outlaw handguns lost by more than two to one. For the NRA, this was the best test of all. But the people in favor of gun control felt they lost because the referendum went too far. They still feel the country is ready for a federal law just to register and license handguns in private hands. An early advocate of that, Senator Adlai Stevenson. There's no debate, no serious debate, uh, about the need for measures to restrict access to the weapons, principally the, the pistol that are used in the commission of crimes. There are debates about how you do it, but not, about, not over that proposition in the uh, more. And that's why the issue is primarily one of guts, of fortitude, of a willingness to stand up to the gun lobby, and by that I mean the NRA. But at its Washington headquarters, the NRA remains steadfast, still pouring out a torrent of bulletins, reminders to its members of who are its friends and who are its enemies, not compromising an inch with its own special faith. But wherever it goes, the NRA is shadowed by this man, a man with a mission, a man even the tough old NRA 
cannot keep quiet. We will have 100 million handguns in civilian hands by the turn of the century. That's just 23 years from now. Will we then be safer? Will we then be more or less free? This is Nelson T. Shields III, a man who, until a few years ago, believed in the right to bear arms. We'll hear his story next week on 60 Minutes.